SBC Media. Welcome to iGaming Daily, analysing the news from the betting and gaming industry all over the globe. Supported by SBC Summit Latino America, bringing together the leadership teams and product specialists from retail and online operators in Latin American markets. Discover the potential of Latin America's booming iGaming and sports betting markets at SBC Summit Latin America, the premier industry event in the region. Join SPC at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Miami from October 31st to November the 2nd. Register now at spcevents.com. We've spent plenty of time here at iGaming Daily discussing the current state of fantasy sports, but today we are going to take a look back. Fantasy sports have arguably been around for 150 years, and they've grown and changed along with sports fans. On today's episode, we're going to take a deep dive into fantasy sports with our guest, founding and current board member of the Fantasy Sports and Gaming Association, Rick Wolf. I'm your host, Jessica Wellman, editor of SBC Americas, and I'm joined not only by Rick, but by our own Sue Schneider. I'm so excited for this today because I know that we're going to get good history, but I feel like both of you have good stories, uh, which is the nice uh add on to the specifics and the the things that we kind of all know but also just what was going on kind of behind the scenes with stuff so thank you for fake making time for us today i think it's going to be a good conversation yeah it should be fun we've rick and i have been talking about doing a, a little history piece like this for a while so uh i learned a lot talking to him so i'm sure our listeners will also yeah rick are you are you ready for this it's painfully obvious that like I I have been studying my I've lived my life for fantasy sports, but Sue's lived hers for sports betting, and we have a Hall of Famer in sports betting and a Hall of Famer in fantasy sports. I mean, I think this is going to be an exciting uh, exciting session. All right, uh, let's just start super broad strokes because some people, you know, they don't know a ton about fantasy. You know, what's the history of it? When did it really begin? My understanding has always been kind of it started in, in baseball and then spread out to other sports. Is that the case? Yeah, and, and that's what we thought initially. Like, you know, when, when I was um, writing software for Fantasy Baseball in 1989 for IBM's Prodigy, you know, we thought that, you know, that it started, a, you know, a decade before that with with uh, Daniel Ockrent writing the, the rotisserie rules with Glenn Wagoneer. Um, but it really starts, I mean— you want to take it all the way back to uh, to Woodrow Wilson making his own dream teams. He wasn't actually playing fantasy sports because he wasn't playing against anyone else. But he was, in 1870, making his own dream teams. And and uh, John Thorne has a fantastic piece on that. Um, but it really starts with Bill Winkenbach. I mean, he was an Oakland Raiders scout. He ran a fantasy golf league in 1955. In 1962, he actually starts uh, the Greater Oakland Professional Pigskin Prognosticators League. Um the that's gopple. a lot of that's a mouthful. The Goppel. Yeah, yeah. There you go. And uh and he starts that in nineteen sixty two. And I think because he felt like um the Oakland Raiders weren't building the perfect organization and he wanted to have people see what it would be like to build the perfect one. So George Blanda being the first uh ever draft pick in uh, that league. And that was just a private league for them where that where, you know, t- uh eight of them played against each other. And then in 1969, it goes public, and as people hear about that in Oakland, in the uh, in the bars and such, and becomes a commercial entity. But before 1969, um, you know, nothing was commercial, uh, if you will. I was about to. I love in my intro that I'm like, how much things have changed, but it's now 2023, and I'm pretty sure Oak or Raiders fans still are disappointed with the way that their <laughs> their into their uh, team is being built. So perhaps not everything changes. Well played, well played. One more thing I'll add to that is I was blessed enough to be uh, inducted into Fantasy Sports Hall of Fame with Bill Winkenbach in 2011, and also the great Peter Shanky, um, who ran Roto News and was a pioneer for news um, and reporting for fantasy sports players. Um, so, yeah, just blessed that those two humans went into the Hall of Fame with me, and, and his grandson was there posthumously to accept the award, and it was really just a beautiful moment in 2011. And in terms of that association, when did that association actually start then? The the FSGA started as the FSPA. It was the FS Players Association. And basically, it's the same thing that, that's going on now, right? It was the confusion that fantasy sports was gambling. And because of that, there were attacks from legislation against 
the players. So we were trying to protect the players. That's what we thought we were doing anyway. I was then running CBSSports.com, and uh, Greg Ambrosius, of course, was writing magazines for Krause, um, and a handful of others, Steve Bird from Stats, and um, Christina Shellhart from Sporting News, some names you may not know, um, James Sarah from, from um, Insights, from Fantasy Insights. Those people got together, and we started the trade association to protect the players. Um, but what happened shortly after that is we realized that we, we had the ability to help growth with each other. And by having more people play fantasy sports, we would have a bigger voice and we'd be able to pe- protect them more. So we said, okay, we're going to try and grow fantasy sports as much as we can, because by doing that, we can, we can then be able to protect, the, protect it from being thought of as gambling and then, of course, uh, be illegal. So can I ask, what, what year was that? That was 1998. One small point on that, like there were uh, media companies promoting offshores then at, like they are now. Uh, in 98, 99, 2000, until um, the sporting news got a $8 million fine from the government, and then all the media companies shut down on, you know, uh, then it was um, MVP Sportsbook and uh, Bodog and, you know, a handful, uh, Bravada, all these ones that were uh, in Costa Rica or offshore, and uh, they were being promoted by by media companies heavily, just like they are now for FTDs, and fantasy companies were booming with revenue from there that just got shut down in the early 2000s. And and the, the thing that I wanted to uh, ask you about, too, because, again, I, I got involved in 95 looking at, at iGaming type of uh, businesses. But we in St. Louis, we had CDM here, and they certainly had their um, uh, legal precedents that they were doing. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because I, I just found that an interesting case when it was going on, too. Yeah, well, for the, those people who don't, uh, that's a different genre, and it's a very cool genre. In uh, in newspapers, they would print the salaries of the players, and then you would actually write on a piece on a, on the the piece of paper and mail it back in in the early '90s, and then they would put it into their computers, and then they would run your league from there. And each week, you could mail in another another any changes you wanted to make. So all the things that were being done electronically pre-internet were being done by CDM and another company in Boston called Replica. They were fighting for the business of Sporting News and uh, USA Today. And then we had this little thing called the strike in 1994. It just pre-internet, because internet, remember, is December 1994. Um, it, that, that moment, that, that seminal moment is what actually makes CDM. Because Brian and Carol and, uh, and, and Charlie Wiegert, uh, Brian and Carol Matthews, and Char- that's, what it, that's what it means, right? <laughs> Carol D. Matthews. Um, so... Uh, they they had the um, wherewithal and the business sense to get through that grind where Replica went out of business. So they lost their main competitor, and then in 1995, they began to explode. In 2005, um, uh, Major League uh, Baseball Advanced Media bought the rights to from the Players Association, from the MLBPA, to uh, own that. So they own the EA Sports, um, huge contracts, but they felt that they also... Um, owned the rights to to the players' names and statistics. And so they sent cease and desist letters to a lot of the people in the, the fantasy sports industry, including CDM. Um, and then, so most of the companies did what I did. I was running All-Star Stats, a big, um, and, and Sandbox.com, two big uh, fantasy companies at the time. Uh, we wrote a letter back to them and we said, we don't think that you do have the rights to that. Sue us if you think we do. And we kept doing business. The CDM folks felt like they, um, like they were their partners the whole time, and that so they sent them a letter saying that they would, you know, they would like them to clarify that they can continue to do business. When they didn't say that, they sued them for the right to do business. So CDM or CBC was sued, um, sued Amobam for the rights to be able to uh, use the players' names and likenesses as uh, as part of the rights of 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 them being news. Um, because the statistic, you know, two for four with three RBIs is a statistic. But if it doesn't say, you know, if it doesn't say Kettle Marte next to it, it it means nothing. Yeah, you say names and likeness. Like, I assume you don't mean, like, we're going to take their pictures and put their picture. It's literally just the stat line and the name associated with the stat line, right? It's just the name and the stat line. The likeness, the likeness uh, is the players as far as commercial products go for fantasy but as far as news goes um the likeness of the player being that they're a personality 
yeah um is is protected under the first amendment okay so the key moment here really happens and this is in the 12th district it's only in Min- minneapolis and we we figure that every co- every fantasy company is going to have to litigate in order to be able to get the rights in every, in all of the other districts all the other uh, their 18 districts um but uh the fsta under the leadership of greg ambrosius um delivers an amicus brief uh written by glenn glenn colton's firm uh and uh and that brings the First Amendment to it. That makes it a First Amendment issue, and that makes it national. So when the case is won by CDM, it's a national case, uh, and then the, the the stats and the and the players' names are then um, you know allowed for all fantasy companies to be used for fantasy games. It's a big it's a big moment um, because the uh, the ask from the from the M- MLB Advanced Media, and you could say rightfully so, was large and would have. You know, would have pared down the number of of fantasy companies to a to the small few that could afford to live with that kind of profitability. Right, and I I think some of the other things that are interesting. You talked about some of the legislative challenges that got thrown in as they were looking at bans related to internet gaming in in Congress. And I remember when uh, I I, I want to say it was one of the. Uh, uh, political conventions, maybe the Republican convention, where there was a a plane flying overhead, I believe in Denver or something, at some point, saying, you know, let us have our fantasy sports, basically. And I know, in terms of lobbying yeah. that I did, in uh, on Capitol Hill, I would go in to talk about internet gaming, and the staff person there would have their fantasy sports screen up. So that whole struggle to try to make a, a distinction between fantasy sports and betting that you referenced earlier was a really uh, big part of, of what I think the industry was doing there for a while. Yeah, and the, the thing that people don't realize is many fantasy companies, because they didn't have an entry fee, um, were basically sweepstakes in most states. Right. So, you know, um, not to get too deep in the weeds, but it's prize, consideration, and then either chance or skill that determine whether something goes into sweepstakes law or something goes into, you know, needs oh. to be a game of skill in order to be legal in most states, right? So um, we would just take away the consideration, and as soon as you take away the consideration and make it free, then the games are free are are, are available to everyone. It was when they were pay to play games that's what caused all the issues, and that's why we were forced to go state to state, right? And you know, and paid fantasy, paid fantasy sports, le- legal uh, um, codifying the legality in every state. Yeah, and as a conference organizer, it was a little problematic for us because we kept trying to include fantasy sports in our content, and they were going, no, 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 we can't be involved with that. So it's been kind of a longstanding uh, line in the sand that the uh, the, um, the industry's tried to, to put there. So I was not familiar with the CDM case, so it was fascinating to hear about it. For me, I think the first big case that kind of stands out in my head and in my experience in the business had been not so much a legal case, but the passage of UIGEA in 2006 and that fantasy carve out. Where were you when this was happening and and what insight can you give on how this carve out kind of came to be? Yeah, well, um, it, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I was running the trade association. I was the chairman of the trade association, but the pre- in, in the FS in the FSG world, the president runs the, the trade association, not the chairman. So Greg Ambrosius was my partner in this, um, certainly full partners. But we, the NFL Players Association um, was representing all the players associations, trying to make sure it would carve out fantasy because they had so much money involved in it, and it wasn't hurting anybody. They had There weren't any cases of people like playing in their home league for $200 a piece and, and not making their mortgage. So um, we said we have to carve out, uh, you know, we have to carve out fantasy. I had um, I had been running a company called uh, All Star Stats, which owned Roto Worlds, and we had a a piece of software that we called Snapdraft that was daily fantasy sports, um, but we didn't launch it because it wasn't legal at the time. So um, we had bought a piece of software from a, a guy named Chris Fargus, who's a fantastic human, um, and he uh, he had a, a, a product called Instant Fantasy Sports. So we bought his software and we rebranded it. Snapdraft, and we had planned to, to merge poker with daily fantasy sports. Give me a sit and go, give me a sit and go, and then draft my baseball team, and then play poker all night at the same time, right? So obviously uh, the poker part got, it was not on the table for us to discuss how to keep the poker part in, but 
Clay Walker and uh, and I think Chris Russo from the NFL. Those two guys um, were in the room, and I know they were on the phone with Greg Ambrosius trying to make sure that we got that that um, piece right. We were not trying to save daily fantasy sports. It came as a um, it came as us trying to get the other language right. It just came as a as an offshoot of it, and we were happy to have it. Um, we did not think it was going to explode a, a whole new industry. We thought that a couple companies like Snapdraft and others would have, you know, good daily fantasy. But we didn't think that it would be a thing. We didn't think that it would be as big as it it became. Um, and uh, and and that you know that whole genre just got so interesting. As you know, we had this product, but we'd just been bought by NBC, and NBC's was owned by GE, and GE's counsel didn't believe that it was legal, even with Eurasia, because it didn't push down to all the states. That's the big mistake they made with Eurasia. Is they, they made they they planned on pushing it down to the states, and then at the time they didn't feel like they had the votes to get Eurasia through if it, if it was pushed down to the states. So they made it just kind of like a guide. It ended up being a guideline more so than a law than a than a binding law in any state. So although it was really important for what the message it sent, and it did the main thing it did. This is gonna sound really weird and deep in the woods, but it's important. It defined what a bet was. There wasn't a single federal law anywhere that defined what a bet or wager was. So this made the definition of that and then allowed other laws in the states and other places to be written based on that on that definition of a bet. Well, I think the innovation of, of DFS uh, is really the one piece that I think people don't really understand. I think a lot of people that are more new to the industry think, oh, that's just been around forever, where that hasn't. Um, and I, I, I always found that part really interesting to see, to go from a season long type of, uh, competition to daily. So, um, I don't know if there's a way to elaborate on that some, but it's, it's, you know, I think people just assume that that's been around, but it wasn't. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, what happened, Snapdraft got put in a draw by, because G didn't think it was legal. We finally, they finally believed it was legal in 2009. Uh, when we began the development to launch it, we launched it in, in week 11 of, of 2009. And, uh, and FanDuel had gotten out at the, at, in the first week of 2009. So three years later, it went three years before we had like any you know, big company delivering it. And at that time, we had a bunch of other small companies that were emerging, and none of them were named DraftKings. DraftKings didn't start till 2012. So um, you had Draft Street, you had Star Street. Um, Jeremy Levine's first thing started in 2010. Um, and uh, um, Draft Street was a very interesting, very well-funded. They ended up getting bought by IAG, the largest internet company in the world. Uh, and then they got put in a draw too. Like that sort of, that's, I think sometimes that happens. Um, you know, big companies have, I think the, the term that got me was, um, the revenue that we're going to make on one Sunday night football broadcast is a rounding error, a rounding error on the interest of, of one broadcast for Sunday night football is going to be equal to all the revenue for Snapdraft in a year. So well, we're just not doing that. Right. So, and that's, you know, that's what happens. Big companies have priorities and they're important and they know, and they're, they're smart and they're making the, they're maximizing their biggest products. Um, but daily fantasy sports was nobody's biggest product at any media company. What's interesting to me, too, is, you know, I remember the Daily Fantasy Sports push and there was this big conversation. This feels like gambling. This feels like sports betting when it really started to explode. But as you mentioned earlier, so in 1998, people were having these concerns about season long fantasy. Right. So this isn't this isn't a new conversation for the industry. No. And it, and it you know, it might not it might not ever go away. Right. Because it's so nuanced. Um, so we, we tried to, you know, as the association, we've tried to do education a couple of times where we would put out a, an education package, which would explain to everybody. And within the organization, we couldn't even agree exactly on, on the terms and what to say, because they mean different things in different states and they're, they mean different things in different laws. Um, so it is really, um, it's really very complicated, but the simplest way to think of it, right, is that in fantasy sports, you have a set of players who, based on their on-field or on-ice performance, they accrue points, and you compete against others with that. That's the easiest way to think of what fantasy sports is. Was it UIGEA that that brought in the concept that it was more than one game, more than one sporting event? Um, I know, like, in that language, that's a lot of what gets discussed now, but 
has it always been like it wouldn't just be Sunday night football or just one game? Yeah, that was one of the uh, concessions that needed to be made in order to get the carve out. So um, they they believed that if it was on a single game that it was betting. Uh, and maybe they were right, but there were single game fantasy before that. Um, actually, MLB had one on their site in 2002, I think. Um, and on each one of their team sites, they had something. There was a, a really, really cool product called Cyber Skipper, which a lot of people played. It was only a single single game. And then based on that single game selection of players, um, you know, similar to a, to a, to a showdown on, uh, on Yahoo or, or DraftKings or FanDuel. So those did exist before. And uh, those at, after the carve out, those were, those disappeared. Um, but uh, it was, it was a necessary, a necessary give back of something that probably was accurate. Were the people pushing for that just generally anti-gambling? Like, just that was the where the pushback was coming from? Or? No, the pushback was knowledge. I mean, we, you, you, if you understand only certain things, right, and if, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, people think it's a duck. Um, but, you know, fantasy is way different. It's it's about community and about camaraderie and about um, the excite- making the games more fun to watch. Um, you know, where um, sports betting, which... Now, actually, some of the research says, you know, some of the similar things. People are now sports betting um, because it makes the games more fun to watch because now it's legal. Um, but when it wasn't, it was about making money. And so they had different they had different competing things. Now I think they're closer to each other, especially, um, you know, I play a lot of parlays. I enjoy playing the parlays because they're very similar to fantasy, right? Uh, in the way that they, the way that they, uh, that I can set them up so that I can play. But I'm not playing against anyone else. And that's the thing that's no fun. Like it's really fun to see yourself in a list and see yourself beating beating other people. And that's what fantasy. That's the difference between fantasy sports. A parlay in betting, and fantasy sports is in fantasy sports. I see Chipotle attic right right above me, and in in betting, like I either win or lose in my own closet, and that's no fun, or not as much fun. Well, in my and opinion. clearly the leagues had a different attitude between the two products. Um, because like, yeah. like you said, MLB had this, you know, a, a same with media. I mean, USA Today, all these, all these big media and, and, uh, and the leagues both had really had open arms for, uh, fantasy sports, at, at least initially. The brilliant and brave guy who should be, uh, who should be mentioned here is Michael Levy. He was running Sportsline USA when we went public and we became CBSSports.com. And we went to the leagues and said they should have fantasy and we should provide it for them and we could do it on a rev share basis. They all said no. So he opened up his checkbook and he wrote them gigantic checks in order to be the official provider of the NFL and the official provider of MLB. And we white labeled them so it looked like it was part of their sites and everybody thinks that's when they got into fantasy. Well, Michael Levy wrote the checks to get them into fantasy and then... uh, and then we were successful. Three-year deals. We paid them ten million. I think I'm, I don't. I, I don't want to say exact numbers because after this many years, I'm not. I'm going to get it wrong. Um, but it was a big. No, it was. It, it was big numbers to each of them, and we we had tripled the revenue over three years for each of them. And then they both started their own fantasy division. All right, we are unfortunately coming up on time because I could talk to you guys for another hour about this. I guess kind of as a, a parting idea. Where where is fantasy at now? I, I think we still plenty of people think of it as this kind of uniquely American thing, but is fantasy a worldwide phenomenon? Is there a sport or a TV show or a thing that you can't fantasify these days? You can you can do fantasy for everything. I mean, there's uh, there's fantasy wakeboarding. There's fantasy for every Olympic sport. Um, there's fan there's fantasy for just about anything where you can select entities and then based on their performance in whatever it is they can achieve points for you to be compared with others um so there there's definitely fantasy for everyone and and i don't know whether it started here i've been i, I work for a british company i work for um uh, for spotlight sports group they're a fantastic uh, group and uh they have gotten me into playing premier league and fantasy premier league has 11 and a half million people who play uh, on the premier league main site so super popular um, probably similar to fantasy football at Yahoo or at ESPN. Uh, and, and then there's Dream 11 in, in India. They, they started their company in 2008 at our conference. They came to an FSTA conference. Uh, there's a great picture of, of, of that from the conference in, in the CNN article about them. But Harsh Jane and his team 
have created something that's unbelievable. It's 200 million people who play cricket. They just crossed the 200 million line. Um, they make a lot of money, but they're philanthropists. They have a, they, during the, during the pandemic, they gave tons of money to India for people who were in trouble because of COVID. Um, when the tsunami hit, they, they gave a t ton of money to people to help them with the tsunami. They have a $400 million investment fund to help, um, smaller companies. And that's just a great example of, of like someone who's built a business around fantasy and then, you know, feathered it out to help the world. And I am seeing it in more in more regions around the world. So it is something that does seem yeah. to be going international. There's there's one more thing. The, the Brogdon family, uh, Malcolm Brogdon, uh, basketball player, NBA player, his family uses fantasy football in order to raise money for potable water in Africa. So like there are people who are now, and the big league challenge, the Wainwright family has now every baseball team has an NFL draft five thousand dollars a person to play against you know kettle Marte or play against whoever the um people people are and that that money then goes to fund multiple charities so there's a lot of good good charitable work coming out of fantasy it's been like that for 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 decades you know fantasy cares with scott fishbowl has gotten so big um and crazy and fun and everybody loves it and getting an invitation to that is an honor and but you know everybody gives a hundred plus dollars to a charity based on, on getting an invitation. And now you know he's built that into a into a global phenomenon. I'm so glad we got that philanthropy piece in there because I think a lot of times people don't realize, you know, sports betters and fantasy players are often some of the most generous people I've ever met. I don't know about you two. Um, so thank you for highlighting that, Rick. Thank you for the time, Sue. Thank you for your insights as well. And, you know, I'm going to go come up with a way to do fantasy conference <laughs> and, and draft Sue as my number one overall pick <laughs> in whatever whatever fantasy conference is going forward. Thanks so much, guys, for joining us and be sure to keep tuning in to iGaming Daily. Thank you for listening to today's episode of iGaming Daily, brought to you in conjunction with SBC Summit Latino America, being held at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Miami on the 31st of October to the 2nd of November. If you want to find out more about some of the subjects raised today, feel free to explore any of the sites in the SBC News Network. Happy reading.